Amazing choir, thank you so much. What a great way to open our worship service today. Thank you to all of you who are worshiping with us this morning in the church and to those of you who are online and worshiping with us. A very special welcome to our visitors and guests. Thank you. I have a couple announcements I need to lift up this morning. First and foremost, bathrooms. Not toilet paper yet, but bathrooms. Um, the front bathrooms are closed for renovation. They'll be tiled tomorrow and then put back together this week. So please use the restrooms around on the other side of the kitchen. Carol, thank you for sharing your message with us today. I ask that you keep those that are listed on the prayer list in your prayers this week for healing, for courage, for strength, and for praise. Have you started filling those boxes with your rummage sale items? Immediate following worship today, there will be a brief meeting under the clock in the fellowship hall about the rummage sale. Um, so let us know when you plan to help and bringing your treasures, and that's from Linda. We have a couple of meetings scheduled this week. Elders will meet Monday, Congregational Life on Thursday, and then starting this week, the first Wednesday of the month, There'll be game night, or rather probably game day, because come at 3 o'clock, play some games, maybe win some bingo prizes this week, and then enjoy, enjoy lasagna. And for me, who likes to eat supper food for breakfast, that sounds really good right now. Um, as always, check out your insert. I've got one more here about um, Nawala. Is that how you say it, Joanne? Nawala. New Nawala having a fun-filled evening on Wednesday, October 27th, and it's for the kids, and it's for all of you, and we're going to be dressed in costume. All the kids are going to be dressed in costume. I'm going to be dressed in costume. And it's our way of turning Halloween around, and we ask that if you have bags of candy that you've uh, you know, donated in the past for trunk or treat, that you would donate them for our party. So it's going to be a fun-filled night of games and fellowship. It's going to be wonderful. That could be a lot of candy for us. You know how much we bring for, for Halloween. That could be good. And in costume. Um, could you please stand, if you're able, for our prayer of invocation? God in heaven, we praise you for your unconditional and unchangeable love. Your love so abundantly and generously pours in our hearts not just for today, but every day. May we hear needed words of encouragement and feel the Holy Spirit moving us to be strong people of faith. Supply us with such joy that we spread the knowledge of what Jesus the Christ has done for all believers. Amen. Amen. And now, let's join together in our opening hymn.
hear that last note, can't you? Please be seated. Children, come forward for the children's moment. slightly different. We're going to move to here. And while you're asking, why are we doing this? Right here. It's because a lot of people in this church do more than one job. My job is also videotaping. So I have a camera set for right here. By the way, can you guys say hi to Susan? Hi, hi Susan. Anybody know Susan? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we're going to be talking today about character. So, how do you consider yourself as a character? Like, are you happy, sad? What's your feelings right now? Happy? Meh. A lot of what we talk about with character is how do you react when something happens to you that may not be the best? Are you the kind of person that like punches in there and gets to work on something? Are you somebody that would rather go ask for help because it may be more than you can do? Um, God never promised us that everything would go perfect in our lives. What God promised us is that he would give us the help and the strength we need to get through everything we do. So if you had a problem, would you go to somebody who had actually been through what you had been through or somebody who had never had any experience with that and would come up and say, oh, I know just how you feel? What kind of person would you go to? I would go to the person who knows what to do. There we go. Oh, yeah, maybe that had been through that, and they could show you how God helped them through that particular problem. So what we are holding on to is the hope that God will give us the strength to get through all the problems of our life, and that builds character in us so we can help others who go through that problem. Because if we can make somebody else's life and day go just a little bit better, that's what we're hoping for. And if we can show everybody God's love and mercy through his son Jesus, that is the goal of Christians. So can we lead everybody in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for helping us through our lives. And we thank you for helping us build character. And we thank, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've been doing this so long, I've actually thought my dad was a pastor, and I think I have his old shirt and collar. I thought, I wonder what happened if I showed up with that stuff one Sunday, if they'd go, yeah, well. <laughs> So, uh, scripture comes from Romans 5, and I switched it off to 1 to 5 instead of 2 to 5. And it starts, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What is hope? What do we think of when we hear the word hope? My absolute favorite story in the world is about the mom and dad who were concerned about their little twin daughters. So they took them to a psychiatrist and they said, we need to understand why our daughters are so different even though they're twins. 
And so the, and I know I've told the story before. So the doctor takes the first little girl, he interviews them, and he puts her in a little room full of toys, solid walls of toys, and shuts the door. Takes the little, the second little sister, takes her into a room that has this much cow manure in it, or horse manure, shuts the door and leaves her. Comes back a half an hour later. The little girl in the toy room is crying and crying. And the psychiatrist says, why are you crying? And she said, because I know I'm going to have to leave these toys at any minute. And the doctor said, that child has no hope. She is a pessimist and is never going to be able to see that positive. They went in the second room where the little girl was, and she was digging away. There was poop flying everywhere. And the doctor said, what are you doing? And she goes, with all this poop, I know there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> that, the psychiatrist said, is what hope is all about. And this little girl is an optimist. And so when I think of hope, I always start with that story, and it's kind of a mindset. And the second half of my sermon, will talk about that. But we're going to start with the first half, where most of you in here are probably going, oh, God, how long is she going to go? I hope she doesn't last too long. And others might be saying, oh, I saw some yummy bars out there. I hope there's still some left when I get out. And maybe some of you are hoping for a certain outcome with a football game, or maybe you're hoping that it won't rain after you just washed your car. This kind of hope is just wishful thinking, where we desire something, we want a particular outcome, and that's all good and well if we get it. But hope of that sort can sometimes be dashed because we're not always going to get what we want, right? So that kind of hope is kind of wishful thinking. But that definition isn't how the word hope is going to be used with the three virtues of faith, hope, and love. Like most of you who study the Bible, I always want to know, so how often is the word hope actually used in the Bible? This one? 129 times. So apparently God had a plan for that word. There's a website I'd love you to look at called Words of Faith, Hope, Love. And in it, they discuss those three virtues of faith, hope, and love. It says, hope is the beacon of faith in the darkness. I love that. I just thought that was beautiful. In their research, they start by looking at the Greek and the Hebrew translations. The Hebrew translation focuses purely on the Old Testament, and there are three words, yakal, tikva, and kwava. And as you translate them, they mean to wait for, to expect, or to look eagerly. There's also, the, the last one, kwava, is also for the word cord. It's like a feeling of tension and expectation when you're waiting for something to happen, like when you're pulling the cord tight to produce that kind of tension. Then this website looks at the Greek translations, which is the word elpis, which means either hope or trust. Hope in the New Testament means a reasonable expectation, looking towards the future, not only with trust, but also with assurance. Christians need to have hope, don't we? It motivates us to move forward, because life is a never-ending flow of hardships and trials. And even though we might say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, we still realize we're struggling, we're challenged by things. Our Sunday school class is always talking about the hope of everlasting life. And we always joke about the fact, how many of you know for certain because you're a Christian you're going to heaven? And half of our Sunday school class raises their hand and the other half goes like this. And they do that because they think it might be audacious to hope for eternal life. They hope it but they don't feel like they want to say it for sure. But when we have hope, we can navigate through turbulent waters almost without despair. 
We can have joy. We can have peace despite our circumstances because we know we have a God that works to make all things possible. As Desmond Tutu says, hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all the darkness. In our scripture, Paul shows the sequence of hope when he says, we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering creates perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Trials develop our endurance and teach us to trust God despite our suffering. And that perseverance builds our character and enables us to see beyond our current circumstances. Do any of you remember that moment where suddenly you didn't just wallow in your pity over something that was going on? Not that you didn't deserve your pity, but do any of you recall that moment? I think I was in my 40s the first time it happened to me, where I was like, oh yeah, this too will pass. And realizing that it's not always going to be like this, then you can move to the next level and you can say, so what am I going to get out of this experience? How am I going to grow through this? And that is when you start understanding that the perseverance and the endurance and the challenges can produce hope. God made the promise of eternal life. Not us humans, God made it. And that becomes our eternal hope. I do find this all confusing, though, because does this mean we always have to suffer to have hope? I thought, does, does that mean God is going to put us through tough times all the time? That challenged me for a long time. This week, I watched a movie called The Starling. Have any of you ever seen The Starling? It's on Netflix. I would suggest you watch it. It stars Melissa McCarthy, Chris O'Dowd, and Kevin Klein, and these are like heavy-duty comedic actors. So I was expecting I was going to be laughing and entertained, but they took on brand new roles, and it was in a very powerful movie to me. McCarthy and O'Dowd lived a life of hope. They had a brand new baby daughter, but then she suddenly dies of SIDS, and the movie has much despair and sadness. And yet, there was great laughter and great humor as well. As you watch the movie, you see them grappling with the stages of faith. And by the end of the movie, you understand what Paul is talking about when he says, our trials lead to suffering and eventually hope. Franciscan priest Father Richard Rohr talks about the living in solidarity with the pain in the world and how we complicate the pain by resisting it, therein producing more suffering. The soul must walk through such suffering to get to higher, further, deeper, and longer awareness. The saints variously called such suffering death, nights, darkness, the dark soul of the night, most of you have heard of, unknowing, spiritual trials, or just doubt itself. But here's the interesting thing that I hadn't ever really thought about. Necessary suffering allows us to grow in secret. Have you ever suffered and thought to myself, what am I getting out of this? And yet, when you were through the toughest time, you saw that growth? It's an amazingly common concept, but in the teachings of Jesus and many deeply spiritual people. Such growth must be largely hidden because God alone can see it. We don't see what's going on in the middle of our suffering. And God can steer that suffering to our good. If we try too hard to even to understand it, 
We can even stop the process or steer it in the wrong direction. The virtue of hope is the fruit of a learned capacity to suffer wisely, to suffer calmly, and to suffer generously. Hope provides its own kind of meaning, but in the most mysterious way. The gospel gives our suffering both personal and spiritual meaning by connecting our pain to one another. And when we are connected with one another, things change. Because in that change, we then become connected to the very pain of God. According to God, Roar, or pardon me, according to Roar, God suffered as well. But when Jesus came, everything changed for God. So are we to believe that we can only have hope when we suffer? I hope not. I don't want to be there. But I understand that pain and suffering is a part of the human experience, even though I don't relish. Oh, goody, when do I get to suffer again? Oh, goody, when do I get to have pain? But I'm now at that stage in my life where most of the time I say, I understand that this is part of my process, maturing. I remember one day I was up here talking to Carmel Lou, and she told me the story, which probably many of you have heard, that she had something like a dozen people die in her life, and it was like an 18-month period. And I remember just being stunned as she talked about it. And she said, even though it was the toughest time in her life, she realized at the end of it how much she had grown from it. And I've always thought about that when I think of people that have intense suffering because she didn't seem like the type that would, would struggle, but I think that was in that window of time when her husband passed away. Episcopal priest and theologian Cynthia Bourgeau suggests a new path with prayer and contemplation. It's not a bunch, a bunch of those formal prayers. So I don't want you to think what I'm suggesting, what she's suggesting is you have to go down with the list of all the prayers and the rules about prayer. This is simply a time where you are going through the process of trying to reach out to God. And the best example I thought of is how many of you have a pet at home? Dog, cat, okay. Think about that pet when it looks up at you and just stares at you attentively, that's the eyes I want you to do if you try this type of prayer, this loving attentiveness to what God is going to say to you. It begins with purely being present, being mindful, being aware of what God is. Hope is not intended to be this extraordinary infusion, but an abiding state of being. Through prayer and meditation, we actually can become a vessel, a chalice, much like ours, into which this divine energy of the Holy Spirit can pour, a lamp through which it can shine, because we ourselves are not the source of hope. We don't manufacture it. But the source dwells deeply within us and flows to us in an unstinting abundance. So much so that, in fact, it might be more accurate to say we dwell in it. This morning in Sunday school, we were talking about how do you turn the Holy Spirit on? Because we know the Holy Spirit is in us at all times. And I think some people, they, well, I'm in church. Er, turn the switch on. Holy Spirit, come on in. Come on, come on, come on. And then we shut it off as soon as we walk out the door. But what I'm talking about is sitting down for a few moments, turning the faucet on, and just being with God. It's something that can change your innermost way of seeing and start to kind of rearrange your perspectives. 
the journey to the wellspring of hope is really a journey towards the center, the innermost ground of our being where we meet and we're met by God. When we take time out of our busy lives to live this life of inner union with God, we practice heaven now, according to Richard Rohr. God allows us to bring on earth what is in heaven. Every time that we can allow, receive, and forgive the conflicts of the moment, such acceptance allows us to sit in some degree of contentment despite all the warring evidence God alone can hold together all the seeming opposites that we encounter every day, all the contradictions of life. In and with God, we can do the very same thing. Because hope flows towards you from the Holy Spirit, and we literally can become hope not just for ourselves, but for those around us. There's a story of hope that you will water, your mouths will water every time you think of from now on. But apparently in the 1990s, there was a man who was age 65 who was living off of a $99 social security check in a small house driving a beat up car. He decided it was time for a change, so he thought about what did he have to offer the world? Things that other people could benefit from, and his mind went to his fried chicken recipe, which his family and his friends absolutely loved. So he left his home state of Kentucky, there's a hint, and traveled all around the country trying to sell his recipe in restaurants. He even offered the recipe free of charge, asking if they'd only give him a small chunk of the money that was earned. However, most of the restaurants purely declined his offer. And the story goes that 1,009 restaurants refused him. They all said no. But even after all those rejections, he persisted. He had hope. He believed in himself, and he believed in his chicken recipe. He had hope that one day he would find success. And that day, when he visited restaurant 1010, he got a yes. They said yes to Colonel Hartland Sanders, the person who now has started a giant chain called? Boom, everybody knows that one. Romans 15, 13 ends with, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We normally do our songs at the beginning, but we're trying to change some things up and, and enjoy ourselves and, and try to do some different things. We're going to sing a song that we have not sung in a while, but it is a song that we have had in our praise team for quite a long time. It's called, I Have a Hope. And it's not one of those songs I can use all the time because it's kind of specific and it goes perfectly with what you just shared with us. Thank you so much. I have a hope, I have a future, I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over, a new beginning's just begun. I have a hope, I have this hope. Go ahead. God has a plan, it's not 
to harm me, but it's to prosper me and to hear me when I call He intercedes for me. Working all things for my good, no trials may come. God has His hope. I will. for me he's not against me so tell me whom then tell me whom then shall I fear he has prepared for me great works he'll help me to complete I have a hope I have this hope goodness and mercy they're gonna follow me I don't King, no eye has ever known. All he's preparing for me, no trials may come. I have this hope. Chorus, here we go. I will yet praise him, my great redeemer. I will yet stand up and give him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and he turns it into light i will yet praise him my lord my god let's try that chorus again ready i will yet praise him my great redeemer i will yet stand I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. Let's take it down. There's still hope for me today, because the God of heaven loves me. Sing it again with me. There's still hope for me today, because the God of heaven Again, sing it again. There's still hope for me today. Cause the God of heaven loves me. Sing it again, sing it again. There's still hope for me today. Cause the God of heaven loves me. I will yet, I will yet praise him, my great redeemer. I will yet stand, stand up and give him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and he turns it into light. I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. That's right, here we go. I will yet praise him, my great Redeemer. I will yet stand, stand up and give him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and he turns it into light. I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. Listen to this. Remember that? There's still hope for me today for the God of heaven loves me you might be visiting this morning or you might be a, a lifelong member of this church but we all need to come to the altar at some point amen I've come to the altar a lot in the last couple of months and just, you know, life and family. And I don't ever want to forget that we can come to the altar, right? No matter what the situation is.
This is my prayer for all of you this morning. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? You can sing with me. Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. believe that, say amen. amen. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. As a new life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious with us. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bread is a universal food that you find in every culture and every home. It nourishes and sustains all of us who eat it. When Christ said that he was the bread of life, this was a mighty metaphor indeed. He is the sustenance that nourishes and sustains us through all of the times of our lives. In the same way, wine symbolizes Christ's shed blood. His sacrifice was for this very moment, right here, right now, as we're talking, who, where we recognize our sins were washed away forever. And as you know well, Christ took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, eat, this is my body. And by the same token, he took the cup and he said, drink, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This simple act of, of sacrifice is the greatest act of love that we will ever know. And we are gifted with the opportunity to respond. Join me in prayer, please. Loving Father, at this table, we experienced blessed companionship with you and with each other. We thank you for expressing your love for us through Jesus Christ with a love that never gives up, a love that never lets go. Bless us as we eat this bread and drink from the cup. While the Spirit draws us closer to you and Jesus, help us live as you would have us live, people of faith. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And now as we continue to prepare, let us confess our faith. I believe 
in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I seek to follow him as my Lord and Savior. At this time, let's share in communion together. In last Sunday's skit, Abundant Love, remember that? We heard how the different characters felt about stewardship and their own financial giving. They were all varied, but all felt the desire to give to God. We heard about Ted, who shared his financial resources and his mechanical skills by supplying the church with rolls of two-ply toilet paper. Remember that? Okay, you're laughing, uh-huh, because we truly know how important that commodity is to us, especially during the pandemic. We have been instructed in Exodus 23, verse 15, that no one shall appear before God empty-handed, whether that is financially, through our time, through the use of our spiritual gifts. God knows we cannot worship without giving, for it is an important part of our worship, offering ourselves up and our resources to God. So during this time of social distancing, we are accepting our tithes and offerings and your pledge cards in the offering plate when you enter the sanctuary. The gifts may be brought forward, and could you please stand for the doxology? God, we are not empty-handed, and we come to worship you with these gifts, the varied resources that you have provided us. Bless these gifts to be used supporting missions and ministries of your church in ways that bring praise to you. Amen. When we think about prayer, there are so many different ways that we talk about it. I spoke to you um, during the sermon about one kind of prayer, kind of a contemplative prayer. But now we are going to spend some time talking about the prayers, about what is going on in our world. We're going to have some quiet time for prayer. But I want you to close your eyes and think about what's important to you in your relationship with God as well as the world. Gracious, loving God, we come before you today, our arms full of the busyness of life. We carry our burdens to your feet, and we ask that you bless us, that you comfort us, and that we might emanate the light you shine on us. We have members in this very room, members in our church who are struggling, God. Be with them in a very special way. Bolster their faith, and shine your loving peace in their hearts. Give them an awareness of presence in their lives. But we also come before you to seek your aid in those who are hurting. As the pandemic surges again, we ask for wisdom and patience for those afflicted, the victims, the doctors, the nurses, and the healthcare workers. We ask that you also be with those fighting wildfires, fighting angry citizens at school board meetings, the shootings, the problems at airlines, countries who are in turmoil, people that are in Afghanistan. Be with all of them as they struggle. And now, as we have a moment of silence, hear our simple and humble prayers. And now let us pray the prayer that Christ first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. that Christ is the Savior of our lives, and we attest to that each Sunday. We also believe in church membership to support our personal faith journeys. If any of you right now are seeking and would like to find that belief, or if you're looking for a church home, we invite you to come forward at the singing of the next song and be accepted into our congregation. Would you stand, please? My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly lean on Jesus' name solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds is within every single one of us right now. We just turn on the faucet, let the Holy Spirit come, and I hope as you walk out the door today, you leave the faucet wide open. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.